Thank you, Dr. Tryon. Wonderful message. Well, the year was 1918 in the small town of Alton, Illinois, which is in the suburbs of St. Louis, that Robert was born into the Wadlow family. At his birth, his height and weight were normal, with no signs of anything unusual. But as time passed, his parents could notice something was different about Robert. By his first birthday, he was already three and a half feet tall, over a foot taller than others his age. And his fast growth simply continued. When he was enrolled in kindergarten, he was exactly my height as a kindergartner. That would be intimidating to be the kindergarten teacher. He averaged about four inches a year. Special desks had to be made and certain accommodations. By 10 years old, he was 210 pounds, six feet tall, 17 and a half foot shoe size. In fact, here is a picture in the paper when he visited Atlanta, Georgia. He is 13 years old and he's next to his nine-year-old brother and his father. And here Robert is standing at seven feet tall four inches. Parents, how would you like the challenge? I have two teenagers at home, soon to have three teenagers at home. Uh, That would be a little bit daunting to have to lecture my son that was seven feet four inches. Robert, I need you to go to your room, sit on your bed. I'll be up in a minute and we're going to (laughs) talk. Yeah, dad, no problem. By the time he graduated from high school, he was eight feet, four inches tall. Here's a picture with his mom and his dad. Can you imagine trying to iron those pants on an ironing board? Here's a picture with the entire family. Uh, Let me ask you this question. Can you find Robert in the picture? (laughs) What would it be like to be his siblings? Yep, that's my big brother. His ambition was to practice law. That's another thing that I think would be quite interesting to imagine him towering over the witness stand. Were you or were you not on the scene of the crime on March 6th? (sighs) Don't hurt me. Well, that didn't exactly pan out. Uh, He was more of a celebrity of sorts. He did tour for a a time with uh, Bailey Brothers Circus, Um, had various speaking engagements, was sponsored by some major shoe companies that would supply him with his custom size 37 foot, or not foot, 37, size 37 shoe. This is actually one of Robert's boots. Uh, A friend of mine, Alan, let me borrow this, Alan Reynolds, some of you might know who he is. He's a shoemaker in town. And uh, his mother purchased this boot. She tried to get both of them. Uh, Was it his mother or grandmother? But they wouldn't let, you can tell he actually wore it. Do you see the the wear on the bottom? I mean, I thought that this was actually just a, um, you know, something they make to put in a shoe store. Not at all. In fact, if you look inside, there's some nice lining that's starting to rip a little bit. Uh, But this this is the real deal. That's Robert. I mean, can you imagine? Look at where this thing comes on me. Let's just do a little comparison here. I mean, that's, that's, anyway, that's Robert. Sadly, he developed some issues with his body continually growing. He needed some leg braces. Uh, this was some time ago, his, his legs or the braces made some relatively minor infection in his leg, but it got worse and worse and worse. It wasn't treated. And so, sadly, that is how he met his demise, was simply an infection that went toxic throughout his system. He died at 22 years of age, unfortunately, uh, but his, where did my clicker go here? At his death, he was one inch shy of nine feet tall, and he had not stopped growing. He weighed 440 
pounds. Um, the autopsy found that he had a, uh, let's see, hypotrophy of his pituitary gland. Uh, so it just, basically the growth hormone kept being produced, kept being produced, and so he never stopped growing. And so in 1986, a life statue was erected in his hometown there in Illinois, and there's at least 10 other replicas around the country, Ripley's Believe It or Not, and various places. Uh, but to this day, he's remembered as the gentle giant. Well, today we're continuing our series on David, a man after God's own heart. And today's piece, Giant Lessons Worth Remembering. I'm dedicating this sermon to Benjamin Johnson, who's not here this morning, he's watching online from home, but he's been looking forward. David is one of his favorites, and David and Goliath is one of his favorites. So Benjamin, we're not skipping this story, we're going to go through this story. Um, but this giant that we talk and find in Scripture in this next piece of our series is far from a gentle giant. Uh, <clears throat> And while we don't know his exact size, somewhere between nine and a half and 12 feet tall, depending on if you're looking at the regular cubit or the royal cubit, and some debate goes back and forth between that. But this morning, metaphorically speaking, what giants are you facing today? Perhaps it's an issue of divorce. Your marriage is breaking up. Perhaps there was a class that you just have to pass and it's not looking good. Maybe it's a financial giant that looks like it will crush you. Maybe it's a lifestyle habit that you can't seem to give up. Maybe it's a lump and it's been diagnosed as malignant. Perhaps your child's in rebellion. Perhaps it's a serious surgery. And the odds are not as good as you would like. What giants are you facing today? Today I want to look at five survival keys when facing the giants of life. And I hope you brought your Bible. And I hope you brought something to, to mark your Bible with. Uh, I know I like to really mark my Bible. In fact, all of these points are right here tucked in the text of my Bible. And if you like them enough, you could do the same. Maybe you'll say, I don't, I don't care for those, and that's fine. But I believe they're practical, that they're biblical, and by God's grace, I believe that they are doable. So we're in 1 Samuel chapter 17. And while you're turning there, a little refresh. You may recall leading up to this story that Saul has been doing things his way and not God's way. And by the time we get to chapter 15, we see the Lord is grieved that he made Saul king. In chapter 16 of 1 Samuel... Samuel comes to the house of Jesse when the oldest one looks the part of the new king. He is all excited, and God says, nope, that's not the one. Goes through all of the brothers. We looked at this a few times ago. Until finally, do you have any left? Oh, well, there's David, but he's just a lad. He's out with the sheep. Bring him here. And we looked at a few times ago how David... The young boy, perhaps only 16 years of age, is anointed as the next king of Israel. Not anointed in front of his brothers, we're told by spirit prophecy it was done in private, but the brothers are still wondering, why did Samuel come to the house and why is David singled out? What's going on? What does all this mean? And then we get to this story, and we're going to pick up in 1 Samuel chapter 17, beginning in verse 2. And there we read, And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together, and they encamped in the valley of Elah, and drew up in battle array against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side. Now the word mountain is a little bit generous. Some of you have been there. It's more of a, a gentle sloping valley with a creek in the middle. There is one ledge on one side, but now it's mostly just a cornfield. Uh, and it's an it's a interesting place to be as you think and you ponder all of the enemy forces on this side and then the Israelites on the other side and there is this line that is drawn naturally by the valley and this is where they were. Verse four, a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath. 
from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. And he had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels. That's 125 pounds. I was trying to remember what I weighed as a freshman in high school. It was something close to that. This is just his armor. And he had a bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. And now the staff of his spear was like the weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels. That's about 15 pounds. And shield bear went before him. I mean, talk about intimidation. In every way you can possibly imagine, here comes Goliath in all of his brute force, in all of the, the latest of technology, if you will, in terms of his armament, who is able to go against Goliath? I mean, if Robert Wadlow was 440 pounds, and in fact, we, we read here in Spirit Prophecy, volume 1, 370, but the Philistine proposed their own manner of warfare in selecting a man of great size and strength whose height was about 12 feet. So if we take that, if we take it as the royal cubit, 12 feet tall, let's do this for a minute. If I'm holding this tape measure... This is about four feet right here. Twelve feet from this spot, I need to go another eight feet up. Right about there. On the floor, here, we'll come put it over here by the boot. <laughs> Can you imagine? So here's the idea. Instead of everybody... I was curious. Yeah, it's, it's pretty close to the top of that. I mean, he could put his Bible up there if he wanted to. Instead of everybody, you know, wrecking themselves in war, why don't, why don't we send out our best? You send out your best. It'll be kind of like a football game of sorts, except it'll just be one-on-one, -on -one, and we'll all cheer them on, and we'll see what happens. Okay? Pull out your man. Hey, hey. Who do you have? Can you give us five minutes? Huddle. Who do we have? I don't know. We don't have anybody like Goliath. No joke. What are we going to do? I don't know. Let's stall. How long can we stall? I don't know, but every day we stall is a day we stay alive. Good plan. Mercy. And so we continue in verse 8. So Jesse, no, 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 wrong chapter. Verse 8 over here. Then he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, Why have you come out here to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. And if he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. <laughs> and the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. <clears throat> That's how I feel about it. That's, in fact, how all the Israelites felt about it. What are we going to do? I don't know. This guy's a little bit intimidating. And while it's not recorded here in Scripture, I imagine he's peppering some of this language with some other things as well. As day after day after day, the taunting continues. In fact, in verse 16, we read this goes on for how long? 40 days, almost a month and a half. Day after day, every morning, every evening, more taunting, more taunting, the giant, the giant, the giant. Let me ask this question. Whose battle was this, by the way? Who should have gone out to meet him? Who is Israel's best? In fact, who is their biggest? 
I find it interesting, 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 23, it says, when he, referring to Saul, stood among the people, his people, he was taller than any of the other people from his shoulders upward. That's quite a bit taller, isn't it? So whose fight is this? Really, it's Saul's fight through God's power. But Saul isn't necessarily in real close connection with the God of power. And so this is a problem. I mean, the people thought, we found a, a, a king that's going to be tall and handsome and a warrior, and, and he's the, the leader of the people. Saul's a logical choice, but Saul is not anxious to meet Goliath. Verse 11, in fact, we read, when Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistines, they were dismayed. It also can be translated, they were shattered and greatly afraid. They just knew this is a hopeless situation. They just knew human strength was not enough. This was not a fair fight. I told you we're going to have five survival keys when facing the giants of life. The first survival key we're going to put on the board, don't grow your giants by feeding them your fears. Write it down. Don't grow your giants by feeding them your fears. We tend to do that, don't we? There's a person, a pressure, a worry. Maybe it's job-related, kids-related. Maybe it's a spouse. Maybe it involves money or debt or embarrassment, addiction, some form of shame, hopelessness, a doctor's report, lab, test, prognosis. It's unknown. It's unfamiliar. There's layers of uncertainty. And so what do we do? We rehearse the problem. And we worry and we worry and we rehearse and we rehearse and we doubt in the morning and we doubt in the evening. In, this, in essence, what we are doing is we are feeding and growing our giant with our fears until the issue grows so large, so overwhelming, so all-consuming that we find ourselves paralyzed, unable to move, for fear we'll do the wrong thing. And so we just... Shiver in the corner. To make matters worse, we pray. Hold on a second. Maybe I should finish the sentence. We pray self-defeating prayers. And even our prayer life becomes a rehearsal of our doubts if we're not careful. Dear Lord, you know my hopeless situation. You know there's no hope for me. You know how hard I've tried to overcome. You know how each and every time I fall, Lord, you know the financial pressures. You know my friends have stabbed me in the back time and time again. Lord, you know I'm flunking out of this class. Lord, you know I'm not smart enough. And we go on and on and on and on in these self-defeating prayers. Now, we're told to humble ourselves before God. That's true. But then after you do that, claim his power, his strength, his guidance, his protection. Why? Because he has promised it. So when you're in your prayers, say, Lord, your word says in Isaiah 26, verse 3, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Lord, I need your peace today. Help me to trust in you today. Lord, your word says in James 1, 5, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally. Lord, I need your wisdom today. I don't know what to do. Show me what would be best. How about Philippians 4, 13? I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. So today, Lord, I am clinging to you. I need your strength. I need your power. I need your might because mine is not sufficient. So what's the first key when facing the giants of life? Don't grow your giants by feeding them your fears. Instead, claim the power of Christ and his wonderful promises in his word. 
How about Psalm 42? It says, why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him. Pray that back to him. You just read it there in Psalm 42. Now pray it back in your own personal quiet time. So you read it and you say, Lord, I feel cast down. My soul is weary. But Lord, like this verse says, I will continue to hope in you. No matter what I face, I will praise your name. That's much different than a self-defeating prayer. So we need to keep going in this story. Verse 17. And to summarize what happens there, we left off on verse 11, but uh, David is there. His dad is wondering what's happening with his older brothers, and so you can't just send a text message or turn on the news, and so he says he sends David to go. And we see in verse 17, now picking up our story, then Jesse said to his son David, take now for your brothers an ephah of this dried grain and these ten loaves and run to your brothers at the camp. And gives them some other supplies as well. <clears throat> verse 19, now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines, but notice verse 20, so David rose early in the morning and left the sheep. We've already pointed out in other sermons that he's anointed as king, but he's not self-inflated, but he goes back to the sheep. And on this particular morning, that's where he wakes up, with the sheep. But he wakes up early. Now, I could be reading too much into this, but I like the idea that oftentimes in Scripture, people rise early to commune with the Lord. And while this isn't fully spelled out, and if you want to argue with me, that's okay, but I like the idea that David rises early, yes, to make the journey, but also to commune with God. Unaware, he doesn't know, God knows, but unaware of what he's going to face that day. But he knows, before I leave these sheep, before I, I do anything today, I need to start by putting on the armor of God. And so he rises early. And I believe in that time, not just that day, in the days leading up, God is preparing David for this battle. Do you put on the armor of God every day? You and I don't know what day is going to be that we have to face a giant, do we? Do giants always come announced? Sometimes, not always. And when they do, will you be prepared to meet them? Patriarchs and Prophets 645 says this, But unknown to Jesse, the youthful shepherd had been entrusted with a higher mission. The armies of Israel were in peril, and David had been directed by an angel to save his people. What does that mean, directed by an angel? I don't fully know. Does David know? Or is he just being led and saying, okay, I'll go. I don't know what I'm going to see when I get there. I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm yours. Use me as you will, Lord. But God has a divine mission for David. And so David rose early in the morning, left the sheep with the keeper, and took the things, and went as Jesse had commanded him, verse 20. And he came to the camp as the army was going out to fight and the shouting for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had drawn up in battle array, army against army. When is this all going to cut loose? We don't know. We have to be on the ready. Verse 22. And David left his supplies in the hand of the supply keeper, ran to the army, and came and greeted his brothers. Hey, guys, what's up? Shh, quiet down. Then as he talked with them, there was the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the army of the Philistines. And he spoke according to the same words. So David heard them. Verse 24, And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. You almost get this idea of the taunting, and this giant just kind of goes, and they go, Woo! <laughs> How is this representing the God of Israel, God's people? 
running like mice into the cracks. So the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And it shall be that the man who kills the king will enrich with great riches, will give him his daughter and give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. We're desperate. Verse 26, and David spoke to the men who stood by saying, what shall be done for the man who kills his Philistine and takes away, and what is he concerned with? The reproach from Israel. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of who? The living God. And the people answered him in this manner saying, so shall it be done for the man who kills him. And then Eliab, his oldest brother, He's the more kingly type, the one that Samuel thought, surely this is him? He speaks up. So you have the oldest, and you have the youngest. The one that's in battle garb, and the one that just came out of the field. The one that knows what war is about, the other one that's just this bystander. And so Eliab, he speaks, and he says, the Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David, and he said, Why did you come down here, and with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness, Davy? I know your pride and your insolence. Your version might say wickedness of your heart, for you have come down here to see the battle. Where'd you put those few sheep, David? I know your wicked heart. Get out of here. You just wanted to watch. Yet we have this youngest show great maturity in this moment. He could have rolled up his sleeves and said, all right, you want to insult me and my job and my profession and what I'm about? I've killed bears and lions. And I'm going to take you on. Bang! And there's this tussle, and there's this rolling around, and finally the commander comes, hey, 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 what's going on here? My kid brother showed up. What are you doing here? You're not in, in, in the proper attire anyway. Go on. Get. What would have happened to our story? Kind of would cease to happen, wouldn't it? But how does David respond? Verse 29, and David said, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? Then he turned from him, Eliab, toward another and said the same thing. Notice what David's doing. He's turning away from his oldest brother because that is not the battle he's here to fight. That's the second key for us this morning. Choose the battles. Oh, where to go? Oh, dear. Choose the battles that are worth fighting. The devil wants to trip you up in these little dog fights, these little side things. But here David, David shows great EQ, great self-control and constraint. And he's concerned with how, not how he's perceived, oh, I was insulted, I was offended. No, he is rather concerned about how God is perceived. And that's the battle he wants to fight for. Not for myself, not for my reputation. Yeah, but it's not true, and he's not being nice. Let it go. We need to choose our battles wisely. And sometimes in the church, we're not the best at this. In fact, if we don't watch it, the battles that we choose to fight are with our spouse, our children, fellow church members, folks, all people that are on your team. What are we doing? Fighting people that are on our team while in the meantime the devil is wreaking havoc in our community and we're too busy fighting among ourselves to even notice. I've seen too many dysfunctional churches where the members are their own worst enemy. Have you ever been part of a church like that? Whew. And who's glorified in that, by the way? No, choose the battles that are worth fighting. Let's keep going. <clears throat> Verse 31, now when the words which David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul, and he sent for him. Then David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. 
your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. I imagine Saul scratches his head. I mean, he says it with confidence and humility. Sounds like he knows what he's talking about, but still, he says in verse 33, you're not able to go up against the Philistine to fight with him, for you are a youth, and he's been a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, verse 34, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from his mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Let's be clear, king. It's not because of my skills. When I was in Africa, we went out in some far-off bush and talked to some people that were there. And one of these guys was a, a, a short individual. To be a man in that culture, you had to kill a lion with only a spear. How do you kill a grown lion with a spear? And they explained to us the only way to do it successfully is to wait and wait and wait and stand your ground until this lion opens his mouth to eat you up and the spear goes into his mouth and back into his head and kills the lion. That's bravery. But David here isn't saying, look how brave I am. He's saying, no, the Lord who delivered me from the lion and from the bear, he will deliver me just the same from this Philistine. Here we find key number three. Remember remember God's faithfulness in the past, friends. So often when we face giants, we forget the things we should remember and we remember the things we should forget. We remember our defeats and forget our victories. Most of us could list off our failures in vivid detail, but we're hard pressed to name the specific victories, whether they're great or small. But friends, every person here should have a list of specific victories. Someone's going to say, oh, well, that would be prideful. No, no, no. They're not your victories. These are God's victories. Let's be clear. How God has worked in your life. It may be huge from the past. It may be some simple providence from just yesterday. But if you don't keep a list, you should. That's one of the biggest reasons to have a prayer journal, because you pray and you pray and you pray and you're stressed and you're stressed and you're stressed and then... God answers it. That's a victory. Keep track of that. Put a star by it. Highlight it. So when you need to, you can go back and rehearse the victories. And the same God that was with you here and here and here and here, he'll be with you now. I've seen Christ change the most hardened heart. I've seen God reverse financial trials. I've seen on mission trips when there was no way the passport was left in a plane over there and somehow a lady went out that door and she grabbed the passport and came back in this mysterious door and, mysterious? Anyway, mysterious. And here it is. I've been on mission trips where the the tire was running flat and it made it all the way to the place we were and then eventually it went flat at the last possible moment. I've had times when God has spoken to me miraculously in his word, and you have too. When God told you very plainly, this is what to do. Maybe even spoke to you through a sunset or a sunrise or some other such thing. Record when God speaks through his word, when he gives you victories. Life sketches 196, we have nothing to fear for the future, nothing to fear except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teachings in our past history. So the devil wants you to forget. That's, it's just that simple. But if we don't forget, we have nothing to fear for the future. The God that was with us yesterday will be with us today as well. 
So finishing verse 37, and Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Here Saul is essentially covering up the fact that he's really not connected with God, but he is able to still put out those cliches. Go, and the Lord be with you. And so Saul clothed David with his armor. Notice that. And he put a bronze helmet on his head, and he also clothed him with a coat of mail. Who has all this stuff? Whose battle is this? And David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I have not tested them. So David took them off. Can you imagine clamoring around? I mean, Saul is a 52 long. David is a 36 regular. It doesn't fit. Stuff's dragging all over the place, clunking around. And David says, I haven't tested these. I don't know how to, to fight with this. And he takes it all off. Here's another key. Fight in your own armor. How are you still fighting in someone else's armor? Who are you still hiding behind? What are you insecure about? Now, I'm not saying fight in your armor versus God's armor. I'm talking about fight in your own armor in terms of the giftedness that God has given you. And has promised to be with you. Did you know that you can be 100% yourself and God can use you just that way? Not your sinful self and all the rest. The potential that God created you to be, fashioned you to be, specifically you. Not anybody else in this room, you. You can be 100% yourself and God can use you. He fashioned and formed you to be you, nobody else. Sure, he's still refining us and praise God for that, but he's refining you to be the person he made you to be, not a clone of somebody else. Well, Doug Batcher said he does it this way. Well, Mark Finley said he does it this way. No, no, he does it this way. That's great. What did God call you to do and to be? Fighting your own armor. Everything else is going to feel awkward, uncomfortable. So be who God created you to be. All right, we need to finish this story. Still building, verse 40. Then he took his staff in his hand. He chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook. Here is one such stone from that brook. It's one of my favorite places on this Holy Land tour because it's very natural. There's no buildings, there's no shrines, there's no temples. It's still just a field. Looks like it could come out of Mills River. Kind of slants down in the, in the middle. There's a little creek that sometimes flows and sometimes not as much. Dr. Hosel says, I always envisioned a small pebble, if you will. He said, no, it was more like a, a baseball or softball. And the creek is still there. I just happened to take one with me when I was there. And so he gets five of these. Maybe they're a little smaller, maybe not. I don't know. Some have suggested, well, Goliath had four brothers, and so he was prepared. I don't know. Maybe. But he slips these in his pocket. I imagine his adrenaline is flowing, but I imagine there's also a peace that David has that God's with him. So he himself chose five smooth stones from the brook and put them in his shepherd's bag in a pouch which he had. And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. So the Philistine came and began drawing near to David. Here they're going closer and closer to each other. And the man who bore the shield went before him. Cheater. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him. For he was only a youth, ruddy and good looking. So the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. I'll just pop your head off. How insulting. And I imagine there's this moment of silence as his booming voice echoes in the valley. And David said to the Philistine, 
All can hear this, by the way. You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give your carcasses to the camp of the Philistines, to the birds of the air, and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not say with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Friends, that's key number five. Remember, the battle is the Lord's. You trying to fight your own battle? Trying to fight it your way? Trying to outsmart your enemy, outfox them? You can't, but God can. It's not your battle. I mean, this is the great controversy. It's a spiritual warfare. We are no match, friends. We stand no chance on our own against this giant called the devil. For us to overcome, the battle must be the Lord's, period, full stop. By every stretch of the imagination, defeat may seem inevitable, but God is the God of the impossible. God can make a way when there is no way. God can turn the most certain defeat into a victory. He's done it before, and he'll do it again. So it was when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David that David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Patriarchs and prophets also tells us that he's in such rage at this point that he takes his helmet, you know, that has that little piece down in between. If you have Legos, you even know what I'm talking about. But it has all this protection around. He just rips that off. I don't need any of this stuff to just go take care of this little runt. And so he peels that thing off. He's running down. David's running to meet him. And then David put his hand in his bag and he took out a stone and he slung it and struck the Philistine in the forehead. So the stone sank into his forehead, and he fell on his face. I imagine at this point, everything kind of goes in slow motion. Everybody is watching. It's been quiet. David says his piece, and Goliath had enough. It's go time. And he starts running. Boom, 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 boom. And David starts running, and he pulls out his rock, and he puts it in his sling. And as he's running and charging, and they're running and charging together, finally he plants his feet, he puts a stone in, and how does the song go? And round, and round, and round. And everybody on both sides are looking like, what's just happening? Is this it? Is this how it's going to go down? This is going to be bad. And he's going round and round, and the giant keeps going. And he throws that stone, and sling it goes. heat-seeking stone. And it comes right up and <clears throat> we're told he puts his arms out in spirit prophecy like he's blind and he stumbles a few times. Scripture tells us it sinks into his forehead. Ugh. And he's stumbling. Ellen White describes like a giant oak falls flat on his face. Can you imagine that? We're still in slow motion. Ooh, he's going down, and you just feel or, or hear that huge head hitting the ground and goes, boom, boom, boom. and still there's that moment of silence until everybody says, what? And the Philistine side says, And the Israelite side says, yeah! <laughs> and then there's the gory part of the story. David takes his own sword. Two hands, I imagine. He has to get this thing. <clears throat> it's probably taller than him. Finishes the job. Takes the head back to Jerusalem. 
the armies of Israel are charging the Philistines. The whole battle has changed in a moment. And then it even says that David takes his armor back to his tent. Can you imagine? I don't know if we're going to be able to do it this time. You know, I was wondering that too, but then again, I looked at this armor. Like, I need a bigger tent. Can God do the impossible? When there is no way? In fact, does God delight in doing it that way? Because everybody knew it wasn't David. They all knew it was God. And everything changed, and God's honor was preserved. And so back to my initial question, what giant are you facing this morning? Is there a challenge or uncertainty that seems overwhelming? Does defeat seem inevitable this morning? Well, then you need to remember key number five, that the battle is the Lord's. In fact, you need to remember all of them. Don't grow your giant by, your, by feeding them your fears. Claim the promises of God. Key number two, choose the battles that are worth fighting. Don't get sidetracked on the fringe stuff. Key number three, remember God's faithfulness in the past. Recount his goodness, his leading, his providence. Key number four, fight in your own armor. Be who God made you to be. And key number five, remember the battle is the Lord's. God can turn your defeats into victories. Friends, at the cross, all odds were against Jesus too. He was ridiculed. He was mocked. In the Garden of Gethsemane, the giant seemed too big. On the cross, the pain and emotional anguish seemed too much to bear. But Jesus realized the battle was not his but God's. Do you remember what he prayed? Into your hands, Father, I commit my spirit. And he hung his head and he died on that awful Friday that we call good. But in apparent defeat, God brought an incredible victory. To Mary, the cross looked like defeat. To Peter and the disciples, the cross looked like defeat. But Jesus was not defeated on the cross. The devil tried to hold him in. The devil did everything in his power to shut him up. But in inexpressible brilliance and splendor and glory, Jesus Christ was raised back to life, friends. He rose again, and now it is the cross, that awful instrument of torture. It is the cross we find as our greatest victory. In the cross, we find hope for a better tomorrow. In the cross, we have the assurance that our eternal life is secure in Christ. He's secured our ultimate good. Where? On Calvary. And he intercedes for us even now in the most holy place. Friends, I don't know what you're facing, but the battle is the Lord's. He will have the last word. Just hold on. And the good news is Jesus is no longer dead, but he's alive. We serve a risen Savior. And he's standing at the right hand of the Father. So again, what are the giants of your life? What do you need? God's peace? His assurance? His guiding hand? Perhaps you've been laboring in your own strength. Perhaps you've stayed up late searching for answers. Practically come to the end of all Google searches. Perhaps you've lost sleep worrying about the worst case scenarios. And your proposed solutions, well, they're just dissolving like ropes of sand. If any of that describes you, I want to urge you to surrender your problems and your pains and your sorrows, your stress, your burdens, whatever the giant is in your life. Don't you want to give that over to Jesus today? Don't you want his peace and his assurance today? Don't you want to let him fight your battles today? Because the battle truly is the Lord's. And in the end, we know he wins. Your giant need not overtake you. Your giant need not have the last word. Your giant need not intimidate you because Jesus is alive. And he's fighting for you and he's fighting for me. 
Our every need can be met in Christ. Our ultimate good is secured in Christ. And we too can be conquerors through Jesus Christ. So when a giant of life comes along, pull out 1 Samuel chapter 17. Read through it again. Pray it back to God and say, God, I'm claiming these keys. I need you today. I'm claiming that the battle is the Lord's. Let's stand as we sing. Our closing song is number 506. A mighty fortress is our God. A mighty fortress is our God of hope never failing. Our helper, he amid the flood of mortal hills prevailing. For still our and fall does seek to work us full his craft and power are great and armed with cruel hate on earth is not his equal did we there are a number of giants that are being faced. And Lord, we recognize that we are no match. This isn't a fair fight. 
The giant is too big, too tall, too strong. Has a sword and a javelin and a huge shield. Lord, there's, there, it's just no match. We find ourselves afraid and intimidated and stressed. But Lord, we also recognize that if we come in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel will fight for us. And this battle is not ours, Lord. This morning we give this giant to you. We place it in your hands. And Lord, when we do that, the saying is true yet again. This giant is no match for you. Every giant is a dwarf in comparison to the God that we serve. And so, Lord, we lay hand to your hand. We hold tightly to you. We ask that you will provide a way where there seems to be no way that you, in your time and for your glory, will bring down this giant in your way. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated.